the sports sponsorship market all around the world is clearly evolving with a whole new set of questions, considerations and pressure points to ponder as we head towards an uncertain 2021. Understanding the changing value of sponsorship and of course how to measure it effectively really has never been more business critical for rights holders and brands. Uh, so it's time to take the temperature of the marketplace and who better to play thermometer than Mike Rag, Nielsen Sports Global Head of Research, who joins us now down the line. Mike, good to have you with us. Hi, David. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, we've got a short space of time and plenty to get through. Uh, so let's crack on uh, with uh, that opening statement, really. This concept of sponsorship uh, clearly evolving. I think that's uh, fair. Um, but how is COVID the COVID-19 changing the value of sponsorship based on all the work you're doing? Well, it, it is changing it. And, and in another way, uh, it isn't. So in the very short term, it's obviously shut down a huge amount of valuable marketing inventory and kind of impaired the ability of some sponsorship buyers to pay for what they need. But um, they absolutely still need it. In fact, they need it more than ever given the urgent need that brands have to reposition how they communicate and adapt to how the world has changed. So polling recently across the 5,000 or so brands that we deal with at Nielsen around the world, a whopping 62% said that they were in the process right now of changing their brand strategy to adapt to the uh, uh, crisis. And kind of underpinning it all, the value in sponsorship are really the consumers, the fans, and their behavior is changing faster in the last six months than ever before since the advent of uh, mass marketing, basically. So there's a huge demand out there for meaningful ways uh, to communicate. And I think sponsorship is, is, is set fair to help with that. We have been talking already today to a number of uh, CEOs and leaders from various sorts of sports organizations. And they're clearly looking at the sponsorship market, looking at the relationships with their brand partners. Um, from a brand point of view, uh, you're talking to a lot of people, a lot of clients, a lot of potential clients. Um, how are you seeing sponsor objectives changing given the, the marketplace that we all find ourselves in? Yeah, you're right. So, I mean, first, it's, it's interesting that we're not so far reading any radically new trends in the way that sponsor uh, objectives are shifting. Uh, in the last six months or so. It feels more like that the existing trends have just been really accelerated. So what we thought would take two to three years to flow through into valuation is now happening in a much, much shorter timescale. Maybe two things to pick out specifically. Uh, first, kind of like obvious one is digital, digital inventory, different ways, different kind of creative approaches uh, to um, uh, activating sponsorship from a digital point of view there's already you know a lot of discussion about that in your in your program quite rightly so maybe the the second one is more interesting for me to talk about and we're picking up a really significant shift in brand marketing objectives in particular blurring what might previously have been associated with the com community and social responsibility um, uh, budget and and the kind of core brand purpose so can in some ways sport and sponsorship is well placed for that shift because sports properties, uh, are particularly those that have got really explicit societal agendas, such as the International Paralympic Movement, uh, they're becoming substantially more attractive, more uh, valuable. But kind of broader than that, um, you know, grassroots sports participation, you know, before the crisis was one of the largest pre-existing community action volunteering movements in many countries around the world. And we're seeing a lot of really major sponsors now look at that aspect of the sponsorship inventory and thinking, actually, that's much, much more valuable than perhaps we first thought it was when we uh, did this deal. Yeah, so it's it's blurring. Uh, it's getting more complicated in terms of how to uh, how sponsorships are constructed, um, with lots more different uh, facets to them. Uh, the obvious question, I'm sure. Well, I know uh, one of the things that you spend uh, much of your time thinking about is how then to measure this this new type of sponsorship, this new type of partnership, if you like. What have you What have you stumbled across? Uh, so I'm not sure about stumbling. But the, um, 
uh, I think over the last, particularly the last kind of 24 months, there's been a real revolution in how measurable a lot of this is. So this isn't a direct impact to the crisis. This is really more to do with underlying technologies which are flowing through into our industry, which are just taking things to a completely different level. So we're now using AI to process millions of hours of sport content video. We do millions of fan interviews around the world, but, and this is a crucial bit, we also build thousands of econometric models to understand exactly to what extent those marketing investments are really driving incremental sales for the brands that uh, are making those investments. In fact, we've now done more than 3,000 projects like that across 50 countries, across more than 100 brand categories. So there's a huge amount of normative data, a huge amount of case learning that comes from that, where we're really looking at final outcomes rather than some of the kind of the, the, the measures in between that we were focusing on. So we're far more often now uh, looking at exactly what you can do from a return on investment point of view. Uh, and I think CFOs are now starting to demand that level of evidence in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Stumbling completely the wrong word, Mike. Apologies for that. <laughs> uh, I know it's incredibly sophisticated and, uh, as you say, packed full of, of technology. Um, as complicated as um, some of these partnerships have become, um, brand awareness is still cited uh, reasonably often as a, a reason for a sponsor to engage in a sponsorship. Um, is, is brand awareness more or less important at a time like this? Um, well, it, it kind of depends who you are and what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, but the, the key thing is it's more measurable. And we did one really cool piece of uh, analysis uh, last week, actually. We looked across 4,000 uh, different sponsor and property pairings uh, around the world. And we combined across you know, that massive number of different relationships, actually what is the incremental awareness that's being driven as a result of uh, the sponsorship. And what we found is, well, first of all, the good news is that yes, it is driving significant awareness, but in particular, if you're a brand that has uh, around, when you start off, has a around about 50% awareness, so around half the people um, in, in a market are aware of uh, your brand and half aren't. For those brands, that's the real sweet spot. There, uh, you can look for really significant uh, uh, increments. Obviously, for those kind of at the top with brands that are already um, um, uh, with very, very strong awareness, then there's less headroom. So there's less of an increment from an awareness point of view, but there are other things that you can look for um, if, if you're one of those brands. And maybe one of those things is brand equity, um, which I know is something else that you're looking at really closely. Um, where's the evidence, Mike, that uh, sponsorship does change brand equity? And again, the, the secondary question is around how to measure that in a really sort of meaningful, accurate way. Yeah, sure. So uh, again, I mean, just going back to the uh, the piece of analysis that I was just talking about uh, a, a moment ago, we can see again across those 4,000 pairings um, that uh, we've just been analyzing, really, really significant uh, increases in overall mental availability or brand uh, equity. Often we tie it back to people's willingness to recommend a brand to a friend. And there we're typically seeing uh, really significant uplifts uh, associated with that. But again, one interesting thing is that it tends to be the brands, the more mature brands that get the biggest increments uh, from a brand equity point of view. So there's a sort of life cycle to this. If you're a uh, relatively small brand with low awareness Sponsorship gives you a huge benefit associated with awareness to start off with. As you start to mature and your awareness is already high, that's where you get the really, really big uh, brand uh, equity impacts. And there's another kind of interesting bit to this as well, is that it's not just about having a really strong impact in the brand perception, um, kind of still at the top of the funnel. But as we move down through the marketing funnel, we also see that sponsorship gives a much better conversion from brand perception through to brand preference as well. 
And the cool thing is because we measure this over so many different sponsorships in the same kind of way, we can actually predict that now really, really accurately. So you don't need to guess um, uh, what you're going to be getting when you buy into a sponsorship. Um, we, we've got plenty of norms which will allow us to predict that with great accuracy now. We've got a, around about five minutes left, Mike. Um, so a couple of a couple of uh, questions to throw at you. Um, I suppose the other the other key uh, element or to many sponsorships, increasingly so, is uh, a really uh, using it as a really strong sales driver. Um, how should the marketplace, you know, we've got rights holders, um, probably predominantly, but also brands uh, watching us now. How should we be thinking about sponsorship as a sales driver uh, at the moment? Sure. So, um, well, I mean, the kind of the very simple model that we work with um, uh, around the world uh, at Nielsen is that sponsorship drives awareness. It drives association that drives through to mental availability at the point of sale. Obviously, at the point of sale, there are lots of other factors that come in as well, like price and you know what competition is doing and a whole bunch of other things. But using econometric models, we can, we can sort out all of those things. We can get some very, very precise attribution now uh, down to sponsorship. So kind of like gross numbers in terms of short-term sales, um, we can see very, very clearly how that relationship which varies in different categories, how that relationship bleeds straight through into sales. And we're doing more and more econometric modeling now uh, in order to get a precise answer on that. But there's another really super interesting piece to this, which is that there's a big difference between short-term sales impact and then the longer term return on investment that you get from sponsorship. So typically we're finding that the long-term return on investment from sponsorship can be three or four times that short term sales. So we're working with a lot of brands now and helping them really understand how to understand not, you know, the, the whole cycle of investment and when they get their return back. And talk a little bit more about the technology that you, you hinted at um, earlier and, and the role that that is now playing for an organization like Nielsen Sports, but actually for the for the benefit of the, the whole sports industry um, when it comes to uh, sponsorships and commercial partnerships. Well, I think the big benefit industry is that the easier it is to predict what the return is that you're going to get in the investment, uh, then the less risky it is to make that investment. And particularly at the moment, where we have a lot of brands that are very, very keen to make investments, but are kind of quite risk averse because of everything that's happened, this massively, massively helps. Uh, so we can be super precise now, not only in doing the measurement after the fact, uh, and building the econometric models. But we can use all of the norms that we get from uh, those models now uh, for predictions. And I think that is the key difference. Uh, the industry's ability to understand what return brands are going to get makes the whole investment a lot more affordable. And that then unleashes um, many, many more opportunities for brands uh, to invest in sport. And as I said at the beginning, um, the underlying stock of sport and sponsorship is, is very strong uh, because it's cause led uh, and because uh, it's exactly the type of authentic messaging that brands are seeking. Final question, Mike. You, uh, I know, speak to um, organizations, whether they're teams or leagues or brands all over the world in all sorts of different markets. Um, very generally, um, given where we are in the world at the moment, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the, uh, the industry and the sports sponsorship industry, um, particularly uh, given the conversations that you've been having? Yeah, look, it's, it's obviously super tough in the industry uh, right now. And you know, the reality is that we've got more months to burn through uh, before things become um, uh, much brighter. It's going to be tough going through uh, the end of this year. But the flip side to that is that I think as we emerge from this, I think that we're going to find at least from a sponsorship point of view, the sport is even more valuable than it was uh, pre-crisis. So, you know, longer term, I'm very, very optimistic indeed. 
Good stuff, uh, Mike. I always enjoy talking econometric models with you on a Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. Uh, it's very good to uh, uh, have you with us. Thank you for joining us, and congratulations on a fantastic bookshelf as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Mike.